So why on earth would someone design something by hand? In today's age of computer-aided design software, making technical drawings by hand definitely isn't the most efficient way to put together a design. But sometimes efficiency isn't all that matters. In much the same way that manual machining can be extremely cathartic, rewarding, and even artistic in a way, so can manually drawing prints for your own parts. It's a very personal process that takes patience, a steady hand, careful planning, and, well, a lot more time. But that's what makes the end result even sweeter. After all, a perfectly executed drawing is just the first step to a perfectly executed build. So join me as I put together a new design and share the joy that can be found in doing it the old way. Every design starts with an idea. In this case, I have an idea for a quick setup radius tool for the mill. Think of it like a rotary table, only small enough to fit in my vise and not weighing 200 pounds. It will have no hand wheels to crank, so it will be a lot faster to use, and will include some features for quickly mounting parts so I can round their corners, among other things. With an idea in mind, I can start on the first part of the drafting process, which actually doesn't involve any drafting at all. Yet, there are infinite ways I can approach a design, so I always like to narrow down the options by first doing some freehand sketches. Think of this like a stream of consciousness doodle session where I home in on the form and function. There is generally no rhyme or reason to how things are organized at this stage. The key is to just get something down when it comes to me, even if that means abandoning something mid-sketch. This is usually an iterative process where I work through the mechanics of the design and answer different design questions. Is this approach going to be reliable? Can I feasibly make these parts? Does the value of the added functionality exceed the effort to make it? And possibly most important of all, how can I make it look cool? Striking a balance between all four of these creates what I personally consider an elegant solution. And oftentimes that means coming to a compromise on what will be included and what I have to omit. Not everything can be a Swiss Army knife. Unless, of course, I happen to be making a Swiss Army knife. Once I have the general form and function sorted out, I'll start working through the finer details that will bring this design to life. This is where I abandon my sketchbook and move over to the more critical part of my design process, the drafting table. Much like the other equipment in this shop, I inherited this setup from my grandfather. Oddly enough, he wasn't a draftsman, and I'm honestly not sure why he had this at all. Maybe this sort of thing was just commonplace in households of the 1980s. Anyway, after a little bit of restoration, I've since used this table for every one of my projects. And of course it's ready for the project at hand. Which starts with the paper. There are several sizes and even types of paper that can be used for technical drawing. Mylar and vellum are more pricey materials that are a little nicer than regular printer paper, and they have the added advantage of being semi-transparent, which can be helpful for overlaying sheets. These are some old drawings put together by my uncle, and you can see how the transparency lets you see through multiple drawings at once. While this is pretty neat and useful, I tend to just stick with what I have the most of, which is some 11 by 17 printer paper. Size ANSI B if you want to get technical. To hold the paper down, I use these circular stickers on the corners aptly named drafting dots. Now you might have noticed I skipped over a very significant aspect of the drafting table. The drafting machine. This was my grandfather's, and it's called an arm-type machine because, well, it behaves like an arm. It holds a pair of scales or rulers at a set orientation wherever I move it across the table, which allows me to effortlessly draw lines that are straight, parallel, and square. A belt mechanism within these tubes is what keeps the drafting head at the same angle. Now if I need to change that angle, I can do it right at the head. This mechanism here snaps to common angle positions at 15 degree increments but I can also release this to dial in on any angle I need. And the vernier scale helps me set this accurately to within five arc minutes, which is plenty good for a line drawing. To top it all off, the scales are also interchangeable. So for instance, if I wanted to draw something at half scale, I could flip this ruler around and use the new markings to make a scaled down version of my part, which saves me from having to do a lot of math in my head. The drafting machine is really where all the magic happens in hand drawing. And while they're not a super common tool anymore, you can still buy new ones online, and of course vintage ones on eBay. 
Okay, we came to this table for a reason, so let's talk about the next part of the process, the roughing out stage. From my sketching efforts before, I know the direction I want to go with the design. So now's the time to work out the dimensions, mechanics, and clearances. This step isn't always needed, but in general, the more complex an assembly, the better idea it is to figure all this out before spending the time on the final drawing set. Much like my sketching phase, this isn't a cohesive or polished representation. There are usually a lot of erased and abandoned marks, and in general, I'm not following any standard practices for showing internal features and whatnot. This drawing is really just here for me to reference as I put together the finished prints. This is also the stage where I work the design around material and hardware I might already have and decide on what I'll need to buy. I also tend not to bother dimensioning this drawing either, as it would get really busy really fast but because this drawing is to scale, I'll be able to measure directly from it later on. Sometimes this process can be quick, sometimes slow, and sometimes I get all the way through my scale drawing, decide I hate it, and come up with something completely different. Nevertheless, I can now finally begin working on the individual part drawings. And because these are going to be the end result of all these design efforts, it's worth formalizing these a bit. So I'll start with a border and title block. This can honestly be as extensive as you want to convey the information that you need, but for me, I just prefer to keep it simple with a part description, material, scale, designer, date, and of course, a company name. Now before I begin, there is something I should discuss a bit. The pencil. I prefer to use this 2mm lead holder. This is kind of like a standard number 2 pencil, only without the woody bit. And to sharpen it, you use a little lead sharpener like this. But if your family knows you like old drafting equipment, they might buy you a fancy vintage one for your birthday. This is a DeechGen Sharpoint lead pointer, and uses an abrasive cup on the inside to do all the sharpening. But don't try to use this on your old Ticonderoga, or you're going to be here for a while. The leads are replaceable, and you can use different grades depending on what you're doing. For instance, I use the soft 2B lead for the darker lines of the border and title block, but most of my line work will use this medium hardness HB lead. And for lighter construction lines that I intend to erase later, I'll use this hard 3H lead which is actually what I'll start with. I have a blank canvas here, so I need to spend some time planning on what I want to show, where it will go, and how big it will be. The idea is to show enough detail to make the part, but without anything extra that would just clutter up the drawing. Not every side of a part needs to be drawn if it doesn't add any information. As a first step, I'll loosely lay out the boundaries of each of the views using the hard 3H lead to leave faint lines I can erase later. The major dimensions come right from my rough assembly sketch earlier, and in general, I want things to be evenly spaced and balanced out on the sheet. I'll need to leave enough room around each view to draw dimensions, so this is where the scale of the drawing is important as well. Obviously, if the part is larger than the sheet I'm drawing on, it will need to be scaled down. Similarly, a really small part should be scaled up so you can actually see what's going on. And sometimes, even though a full-scale part fits on the sheet, it still needs to be scaled down to make room for the dimensions. So in the case of this first part, I think I'm going to have to go with a three-quarter scale. All right, let's actually draw something. The first part is the round top plate of my assembly. So I'll need the compass for this first view. Drafting specific compasses like this usually take the same two millimeter lead that the pencil does, which means I can play with the lead hardness here as well. I use the drafting scale to set the circle radius. Then the pointed end holds firmly in the vinyl board cover underneath the paper, making drawing with this tool extra nice. And with the proper lead selection, not much pressure is needed to make a good line. The only downside of this is, well, it pokes a hole in the paper. And the more you have to use that center point, the worse that hole gets. So whenever possible, I prefer to use drafting templates. Circle templates like this have marks that you align with your construction lines to center the stencil. So drawing multiple concentric circles is a breeze, so long as you have the right diameter on your template. Now I talked a bit before about the scales on this drafting machine, and I'm wondering if you caught onto something a bit odd about this one in particular other than it being black, of course. This has two different scales. One is for three-quarter, and one is for three-eighths. And rather than having incremental tick marks along the whole length, there's a small set on the left of the zero, which just means I need to use the scale a slightly different way. Actually, hang on a minute. One, two, three. Only 12 increments instead of 16. Oh, well now I feel silly. This is an architectural scale. What that means is three quarters of an inch on this scale is equal to one foot. So each of these 12 tick marks is equal to an inch. I could probably manage with this still, but I'm gonna play it safe and go back to my original scale. 
I'll have to do more math, but that just comes with the territory, I suppose. Anyway, whenever I want to draw parallel lines, I'll use one scale to make light tick marks at the distances that I need them, then bring the other scale in to extend those lines from the marks. And for long pencil strokes, it's good practice to roll the pencil as you trace along the scale. This slows the wearing of the lead tip and also helps the line weight stay more consistent. Of course, where there are pencils, there are also erasers. But in fine technical drafting like this, you need a little more precision when removing lines. That's where the eraser shield comes in. This is a thin piece of steel with various shapes cut in it that you can use to hide the lines that you don't want to erase. But if you need a little more oomph, there is also another tool. A power eraser. This one was sent to me by a subscriber, and from what I hear, it was a real luxury to have back in the day but I haven't had a chance to replace the old eraser yet, so I think I'm gonna hold off on using it for now. All the lines you've seen me make so far are continuous and thick. These represent the visible edges you would see if you actually held this part in your hands. But there are a lot of other line types used that you wouldn't see. For instance, this dash dot line represents a center line of a hole or circular feature. This can be extra helpful for showing importance of certain geometries or implying feature symmetry. Another line type you definitely wouldn't see in person are hidden lines, which are dashed lines showing, you guessed it, hidden geometry. These are almost like taking an x-ray of the part, but since I plan to have other views to represent those features, I won't clutter up this top view. So what other views could I add? Well, how about a breakout view? Say this top view is a pizza. Thank you. A breakout view is like that one friend that only eats the pepperoni and cheese off the top. You know, like a heathen. The purpose of a breakout view is to show details of internal features you wouldn't otherwise see. I'll define a boundary for the cut, then sort of remove material down to a desired depth. In my case, the center line of these perimeter holes. Threaded holes become more apparent from this view, so I need to represent these somehow. I could go through great effort to draw out the true helical shape of these threads, but for me the juice just isn't worth the squeeze. So I prefer to use a schematic representation like this. Once I have all the features drawn in continuous lines, it can get kind of hard to tell what is solid material and what is empty space. So I'll use some hatching to distinguish the two. The pattern of the hatch is of course dependent on the part material which in this case is steel, and uses alternating double lines. I prefer to use the triangle for hatching just because I find it easier than using the drafting machine. Plus, my triangles happen to have the sort of inner edge that I aligned with the previous line as I work my way across the hatched area. I've only left room for one more view on this sheet, and that will just be a standard side view. When your pizza's in the oven, this is like looking at it on edge to see if your dough is rising. This is what's called a projection view, and what side I draw it on is a matter of where one pays taxes. No, really. I pay Uncle Sam, so I use what's called a third angle projection, which basically just means I show the view on the side I would be looking at it from. I think Australia does this as well. But a lot of the world uses the first angle projection, where they put the projected view on the opposite side. There's an explanation for this, of course, but still, intuitively, it just feels wrong. So I stick with, dare I say, the right way. Because this is a projection view, it means I can use the geometry I've already drawn to help me create this new view. Projecting geometry is one of the major advantages of using a drafting setup like this since I don't have to remeasure for every line. I can just use the scales to project features from the top view over to the side view. But the geometry gets a bit tricky on these holes. Because they're at angles and on curved surfaces, they will technically appear as slightly distorted ellipses. No, that's not just my bad freehanding abilities. It would actually look squished on one side like this. Figuring out this exact shape could probably be done with great effort, but I only need something close in my case. So again, I'll bust out the templates. These ellipse templates give what different hole diameters would look like at different angles. The steeper the angle, the narrower the ellipse. I'll find the one that matches my diameter and observed angle, then just line it up with my projected construction lines to draw the feature. Pretty cool, right? 
Okay, I think that's about all I'm going to be able to fit onto this sheet. While it looks like there's a lot of extra room here, as you're about to see, this will fill up real quick. It's time to add the dimensions, callouts, and notes to give meaning to all these lines. The drawings are helpful to see what's going on, but the dimensions are actually what tell a machinist how to turn this paper into a physical part. I like to start by laying out all the extension and dimension lines. The former being the ones that extend from the edges I'm referencing, and the latter being the ones that get the numbers and arrowheads. I'll fill in the actual values later once I get everything flushed out though. Angular dimensions are shown the same way, except the dimension lines are drawn with a compass from the intersection of the angled lines they reference. Since this is a round part, there actually aren't a lot of these types of dimensions. So for the diameters, leader lines are used to call out round features like the OD and ID. And similarly, hole, chamfer, and fillet callouts use leader lines as well. In cases where I have a large array of features, like this hole pattern on the top of the plate, I can use a simplified technique called ordinate dimensioning. I start by defining a zero point in both the X and Y directions, then add simple extension lines to each hole with their distances from the zero. This style of dimensioning is also very helpful for the actual machining process, as it's exactly how I'll locate and drill these holes in the mill. In fact, that's a really important part of dimensioning. Ideally, a drawing should have all the extra dimensions needed so that a machinist doesn't have to do any extra math. But without knowing the exact machining process, that can be hard to anticipate. Unless, of course, you are the machinist. I have some sort of an idea of how this part will be set up in the machines and where I'll need to reference from. But even with this advantage, I'll probably still be pulling out my calculator once I start machining. I've got all my dimension lines and leaders organized and looking nice, so now's the time to drop in all the values. Drafting lettering by hand is as much of a lost art as manually drafting itself, and I'm by no means an expert at this either. But I figure as long as it's easy to read and a relatively uniform size, I'll be alright. Along with dimension values come tolerances. This is a topic that could easily fill a whole video, if not 10. But basically, a tolerance is how far off from the nominal value your part can be before it starts to cause problems. Wherever I have very critical dimensions, I'll give a plus or minus window around the nominal. And for everything else, I'll use a global tolerancing system based on the number of digits I include. So for instance, two digits after the decimal place would be plus or minus 10 thou, and three digits would be plus or minus 5 thou. This matters a lot if you're having something manufactured, because tighter tolerances cost more to make. But in my own shop, and knowing me, I'll probably be trying to get everything within a thousandth anyway. I should point out here that while this is a common tolerancing system, it doesn't exactly paint a full picture. There's a lot that gets assumed as far as things like squareness, concentricity, cylindricity, parallelism, and other fancy words. All of these aspects technically need tolerancing as well. And there's actually a whole other notation system for that called Geometric Dimensioning and Tolerancing, or GD&T for short. If you really want to blow your mind, give this a Google sometime. Anyway, as far as my purposes go, I'm pretty comfortable with my dimensioning scheme. I know what I mean, and for my own hobby shop, that's what matters. Alright, that pretty much wraps up the first sheet, but there are still a couple views I'll need to add before I can call this finished. First is a detailed view of this dovetail feature, and second is a section view of the part. I probably could have squeezed these on here, but it's also no big deal to spread this over to a second sheet. So I'll put together a new title block and border, then I can finish this out. First is the detail view. This is like inspecting the pizza through a magnifying glass. Not sure why you would need to do this, but I've started the analogy, so now I have to stick with it. Back on the first sheet, I outlined the area that I want to zoom in on, so now I just have to draw it at a larger scale here. This is also somewhat of a unique feature to dimensions, since some of the faces and edges won't be possible to measure directly. Instead, what I'll have to do is insert gauge pins in here and then measure between those. So that's exactly what I'll show in this drawing as well. I just have to do a little math to figure out what those new indirect dimensions are. Last is the section view. This is like slicing that pizza to look at the layers from the side. Okay, I'm done, I promise. The purpose of a section view is to show the details of internal features you wouldn't otherwise see. Back on the first sheet, I'll add a section line along the part where I want to make that imaginary slice. This is usually a double dashed line of double thickness with arrows indicating the side of the slice I want to look at. 
Back on my new sheet, I can draw out the section view in the same three-quarter scale. If this were on the same sheet as that top view, I could use the same projection technique that I did with the side view. But fortunately, the details I'm showing here are pretty straightforward to replicate. After filling in all the solid lines and thread features, this view also gets hatched as well. And with all the additional views finished, I can add dimensions, callouts, and notes like I did before. No need to add dimensions already on the first sheet though, just the new value specific to these views. Now, finally, after all that work, this first part is complete. It was by far the most complicated, so it was a good example to show some of the drafting basics. The rest of the parts are pretty much the same process. Lay out the views, fill in the details, then finish with annotations. A full drawing set like this is no small task. In total for just this project, I probably spent close to 20 hours putting these drawings together. And by the end, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't questioning my sanity and doing these without CAD software. But even though it was tedious, and even though I'm very ready to get up from this chair, this exercise has brought with it the immense satisfaction that comes with making something with my own two hands. Each line was carefully thought through with the machining process in mind. So now not only do I have a nice looking set of drawings that I'm proud of, but also a thorough understanding of this project and a detailed plan of exactly how I'm going to bring it to life. Which means all that's left is the best part. The machining. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time.